battle of Badr. And just as a quick revision, inshallah ta'ala, want to look at a number of issues, or go over a number of issues we went over last week, inshallah. The first of those issues is the Ghazwa, the battle of Badr, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he participated, yani Ghazwa al Badr al ula the first battle of Badr. Now, what was the reason, what was the cause for this battle? Why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decide upon the battle of Badr, the first battle? What was the reason? The reason was, no, they declared war. Barakallahu fi. They wanted to raid the caravans of the mushrikeen to take the booty, and the booty was fully loaded. So the initial intention behind the war was to raid the trade caravans of the mushrikeen, the people of Mecca. And this trade caravan, they wanted to raid it on the way to where? To Sham, to Syria. And what happened? They missed it. They went to Medina and waited, and on the way back from Asham, they wanted to raid it again by meeting it where? In Badr. And why did they decide upon meeting it in Badr? Why Badr? Because every single trade route and every single traveler, they have to pass through where? Badr. It was like a pit stop or resting place that the Arabs, they'll stop to rest. So they had to pass through Al Badr. And Badr, as we said, was an easy place to lay a siege upon the people because there's only three exits north, west, and south. And it was easy for the Prophet ﷺ to block all of these exits. And also, we know from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not highway robbers. We don't steal, nor do we raid caravans. But the Prophet ﷺ, why did he raid the caravans of the people of Mecca? Barakallah fi. To return the wealth of the Muslims that was forced to be taken from them in the first place. To return back their wealth. Also, we said they just went to raid the caravan. So therefore, it was not for the purpose of war. It was not a harm. Which is why the amount of Muslims that participated in raiding the caravans were how many? Only 314. 314. Because there was not a war and they had two horses with them. However, on the way back from Asham again, the caravan, he escaped them. Why? Because Abu Sufyan, due to his reconnaissance, he knew the Muslims were coming to raid his van. And not only did he take a different route, what else did Abu Sufyan do? He sent a message to the Quraysh. And the Quraysh now went out or came out for what? For war. And how many were the Quraysh in number? 1,300 against 314. Which is why Abu Jahal, when he knew there was so much in number, even though it was advised that the caravan is safe now, let's go back, he refused. He refused to go back because to him it's going to be a walkover. And Abu Jahal said, we're never going to go back until we spend three nights in Badr and alcohol is drank because it's going to be a party 314 against 1,000 people come out for war and we're going to slaughter camels and bring in dancing girls so now the Prophet وسلم, we did not come out for war the scenario had changed so the Prophet وسلم, started to seek the opinion of the Sahaba should we go back or should we stay? And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Sahaba said, "We'll do whatever you want. Either we stay or we go back." But he kept repeating, "Ashiru alayya, ashiru alayya. Give me your opinion." Why did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam keep keep repeating this? Give me your opinion. Why? Barakallah fi to get the reformation from the people of Medina. Because the people of Medina, their covenant was the prophet, with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was they would defend him so long as he was attacked where within Medina. But outside Medina, it's not part of the covenant. But what did the people of Medina do? They still supported the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is spoke on their behalf. So now it was affirmed they're going to fight. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one of the first things they did was to build a risha, a place where like a command center where the battle will be planned. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uses for salah, for dua, and servitude to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and also planning the strategy. And one of the strategies they came upon was what? To block the wells of who? The mushrikeen. So therefore they're forced to come forward. And one way, one of the most important thing in a battle is to choose where you want to fight your enemy. It's 50% of the victory. So they chose where the enemy wanted to be. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam employed this strategy. So reach to the night of Al-Badr. That on the night of Badr, what happened? It rained. And this rain was sent down upon the believers as a what? Sakinatan. 
as tranquility for the believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said the Sahaba, they slept the best sleep of their life. That even though in a few hours they're about to take place in a battle, but yet they slept a beautiful sleep, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. إِذْ أَمَنَةً مِنْهُ that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused sleep and slumberness to overtake you with peace and serenity, with the rain. And this rain for the mushrikeen was a what? A calamity for them. The opposite exactly. So this was the light of Al-Badr. And then the morning of Badr. And when was the morning of Badr that it took place? The 17th of Ramadan. Two years after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sabah al-Badr. The battle is about to take place. Fi sabah, yawm al-Badr, yawm al-Jum'ah, on the day of Jum'ah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba, they prepared to meet the mushrikeen. On a day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he calls that day, because when a day has a speciality or some kind of uh, special attribute or excellence, it has a name. And this day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it a name. And what's the name of this day? 17th of Ramadan, two years after Hijrah, Yawm al-Jum'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it Yawm al-Furqan. This is the day of the criterion. That's the name for the day of Badr. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Yawm al-Furqan. The day of Furqan. Yawm al-Taqa al-Jama'an. Allah ta'ala called the day of criterion. Why? Criteria on that day between what? Tawheed and shirk. Between haqq wal batil. Between truth and falsehood. Between iman and kufr. Between families, there was no nasab, there was no lineage anymore. Your alliance is to Allah Ta'ala, the Prophet and the believers. Because in this battle, some of the Sahaba killed their own fathers, their own brothers, their own cousins. So that day Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala said, Yawm al-Furqan. This is the day of Furqan. Yawm al-Taqa al-Jama'an. The day the two armies, they met. So the two armies, they met on this day, Yawm al-Furqan. And when the two armies they met, the tradition in those days, or the custom in those days, that there'd be a duel, meaning a one-on-one -on -one fight with a sword. They would start with al-mubaraza, a duel. So in this duel, the best and the most elite and the aristocrat of that tribe would step up for this duel. So the people that stepped up from the people of Mecca was Shaybah ibn Rabi'ah. Secondly, Utbah. Thirdly, Walid ibn Utbah. And when these three came out, these are from the aristocrats, the elite of Quraysh. When they came out, they said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because they're not just anybody, أَخْرِجْ لَنَا أَكِفَّائِنَا وَأَكِفَّائَنَا مِنْ قَوْمِنَا Send out to us to battle with us in this duel, one-on-one -on -one fight, from our people who was of the same ranks, social status as us. Nobody else. مِنْ أَكِفَّائِنَا Send them out to us, people of the same social status, because it'd be a aib, shame, for them to fight a slave, for them to fight a servant. They wanted people of the same social status. So who came out? Three men from the Ansar. And they didn't know them. Says, men antum, who are you? So the people on Ansar brought down their lineage for them. Ana fulan, ibn fulan, ibn fulan, ibn fulan. I'm such and such a person, the such a son of such and such a person. When the Quraysh, these three had the lineage of these people from Asar, they said, Antum qawmun kiram. Your lineage is extremely honorable. Extremely honorable. Walakin lesna fikum haja. But we're not in need of you. Akhriju lana akifa'ana min umumatina. We don't want you. We want you to bring out people of the same social status as us from our, the children of our uncles, our cousins. We don't want you. We want the people of Mecca, the best of the people of Mecca. At this point, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he called out three other Sahaba, who of course was from the best of lineage. First of them was Ubaid ibn al-Harith. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after calling Ubaid ibn al-Harith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called upon the line of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who's the line of Allah, ya Salman? Who's Asadullah? Barakallah fiqh. Hamza. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Qum ya Hamza. Hamza stood up. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Qum ya Ali. Stand up, O Ali. So now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called upon these three. And this shows the leadership of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That a true leader in battle, 
doesn't just stay behind the scene. He gets involved. Not only does he get involved physically, he puts his family upon the front line. Upon the front line. Whereas most military leaders or leaders, they'll keep their family and, say, family and friends and kin safe. And they send the children of their subjects into war. If you look at most wars nowadays, how many of these people that initiate, plan, engage these wars, their children are actually in the war? If it's no one, if it's truly a sincere cause. And likewise, from the people of Bid'a or the extremists from the Muslim Ummah that encourage people to do these acts, these impermissible acts that they call jihad, how many of them, if it's such a glory, how many of you have gone out there? How, why don't you go? Why don't you go yourself or send your children? So the Prophet ﷺ put his family on the front line. Why? Was Ubayd ibn Harith to the Prophet ﷺ, his cousin. Was Hamza to the Prophet ﷺ, his uncle. His uncle and his what else? His brother. True what? Through Rada'ah. True breastfeeding. And who is Ali radiallahu an? The cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these three, they stepped up for the deal. So when they stepped up, Hamza, he said to the Quraysh, Anahnu akifa'ukum, are we suitable enough for you? They said, indeed, you're suitable enough. So they stepped up for the deal. When they stepped up, Hamza radiallahu an, Asad, Asadullah azza wa jal, immediately he killed Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, ala tool, straight away took his head off. Second to step up was who? Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. Ali, he killed Walid ibn Utbah. And then the duel remained between who? Ubaid ibn Harith and Utbah. And they struck each other and inflicted injuries upon each other. So at that point, Ali and Hamza quickly, they tagged him and they killed Utbah. But as for Ubaid, he was severely injured. And a few days later, Ubaid radiallahu ta'ala an, who? He passed away after the battle. After this duel now, the battle begins. The duel is like a warm-up. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the battle was about to begin, he did the same thing he always does. And what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always do? What was the main point of that command center? For dua. So the main thing that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do on every single step of the way, and this shows us the importance of what a dua. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma hadhi Quraysh, قَدْ أَقْبَلَتْ بِخُيَلَائِهَا وَفَخْرِهَا That this is indeed the Quraysh. They have come with their pride and arrogance. يُحَادُوكَكَ or يُحَادُوكَ وَتُكَذِّبُوا رَسُولَكَ That they are in opposition to anything you sent down, O Allah. وَتُكَذِّبُوا رَسُولَكَ And they deny your Prophet. اللهم فَنَصْرُكَ الَّذِي وَعَدْتَنِي أَلَّهُمَّ أَحْنِهِمُ الْغَدَاتَ So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O oh Allah, the victory which you've promised me. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kept repeating this. نَصْرُكَ الَّذِي وَعَدْتَنِي The victory which you've promised me. The victory which you promised me. أَلَّهُمَّ أَحْنِهِمُ الْغَدَاتَ O oh Allah, destroy them completely. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after making dua, he went to the rows. and started to arrange them in rows. And while the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was arranged them in rows, it was Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. After they were arranged in rows, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went back away from the, the troops again to the same camp or the same tent they had built for him. And what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam go there and do again? Dua. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was Abu Bakr, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when there's a dua for haja, he will make it in the most exaggerated form. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this tent now, he looked out and he saw the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi raised his hand so high. You know, normally you make dua like this is like this. The hands of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam were like this. He was asking Allah subhanahu wa taala, not like this, not like this, not like this. The hands of the Prophet were like this, until the ridah, the upper garment of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, would fall down. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, he will feel sorry for the Prophet sallam, and put it on the shoulder of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallam raised his hand and said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma in tahlak hadhi al-isab al-yawm lan tu'bad abada. Subhanallah. This shows the excellence of the Sahaba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh Allah, this small group of men today, if they are destroyed today and they lose in this battle, you will not be worshipped after today again. Subhanallah. This shows the excellence of the Sahaba. 
And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to say, Allahumma in shitta lan tu'bad ba'd al yawm abada. But Allah is your will. If you want to, you could choose not to be worshipped after today ever again. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to say this and continued to make the dua till the rida will fall down. And Abu Bakr will put it back up. And Abu Bakr felt sorry for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, hasbuk, O Messenger of Allah, enough. You've called upon your Lord enough. So then, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent the Sahaba into battle. But while he was making dua, Abu Jahl was also making dua. You know the dua of Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl, he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the mushikeen, when things are difficult and hard, would they turn? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows when Allah ta'ala wants to humiliate and destroy a person that is upon falsehood, he doesn't even know he's upon falsehood. Abu Jahl, his dua was, Allahumma aqta'ana, aqta'ana ar-rahim. Oh Allah, this person, meaning the Prophet Sallam, is cut off what? Our ties of kinship. Aqta'ana ar-rahim, rahim. And then he went on to say, وَآتَانَ بِمَا لَا نَعْرِفُهُ And he's come to us, meaning for religion we don't know. And this is the dua that was the end of Abu Jahl himself. You know what he said? He said, Allah, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, Ya Allah, أَيُّنَا كَانَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ وَأَرْضَ عِنْدَكْ فَانْصُرْهُ الْيَوْمِ Subhanallah, Abu Jahl said, Which when, whichever one of us two armies is more beloved to you, a more pleasing to you, Allah give him victory today. He's making dua against himself. Which of the two is ever more beloved to you or more pleasing to you, give him victory today. So Abu Jahl was making dua. The battle began. As the battle began with the swords and the spears, blood began to flow. Some heads were taken off. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appeared initially as though he was in a trance. Initially. And then, كَأَنَّهُ أَفَاقُ And it's as though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam suddenly came around. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam suddenly came around, who was with him again? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And this shows the excellence of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh. Because for you to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have to be of the bravest. He was always with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ya Abu Bakr, Abshir Ya Abu Bakr. Goliath tidings Abu Bakr. It's like he came around. He said, Abshir Ya Abu Bakr, Qad attack al nasr The victory has come. So it's like he came around. And at this point, whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he saw, who else saw it? The Shaytan. Abu Bakr didn't see it, but the Shaytan saw it. Because the Shaytan was also there in the Battle of Badr, in the form of Suraqah ibn Malik. He took on the form of Suraqah ibn Malik, and he was fighting with that Mushrikeen of Mecca. So Suraqah, according to the Mushrikeen, he saw something. Because he didn't know it was Shaytan, he came in the form of a man. So when Suraqah or Shaytan, he saw what he saw, he started to flee. And when he flee, the people of Mecca looked at, Ya Suraqah, irja' ila al-qital, come back to fighting. The Shaytan, he said, Inni ara ma la, ta, ma la tarawna. I see that which you do not see. Inni akhafu Allah. I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu shadeedu al-iqab. And he fleed. Do you know what the Shaytan saw? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Abu Bakr, Abshir ya Abu Bakr. Hatha Jibreel. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was looking at the heavens. And he said, Hatha Jibreel. This is the Jibreel. And what is Jibreel doing? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Akhidhu, Akhidhu bi'inan farasihi yaqudu ala thanayaihi an naqa'. He said to the Prophet, he said to Abu Bakr, This is Jibreel. He's descending from the heavens. You know what? He said, His hands is upon the straddle of his horse. And the horse which is descending upon the foot or the shin of the horse is full of dust from the heavens. And not only did Jibreel descend in the battle of Badr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amaddahu bi alfin. He descended with a thousand angels. And not only a thousand angels, thumma thalatha ahlaf. And that thousand became what? Three thousand. And that three thousand became what? Five thousand. To give victory to the believers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the mushrikeen, they didn't know what was happening, the Muslims. They just saw the mushrikeen running left, right, and center. And heads were flying off. They said, we see a head fly off. We don't see who took the head off. The head will just fly off. An arm will fly off. A leg will fly off. But it was the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now himself went into the midst of the battle. And whenever he goes into the midst of the battle, he's the one that leads the army. He'll be at the front line. And that's why the bravest sahaba was who? Abu Bakr. Whoever's next to the Prophet is the bravest. So he went into the middle, he went to the front line of the battle, started to lead the battle. The Prophet ﷺ, in the battle, 
he took a grip of dust or sand. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, May the faces become disfigured and ugly. And he threw it in the direction of the mushrikeen. And every single one of them, something went in their eye. This is from the mu'jizah, the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which Allah ta'ala mentioned, وَمَا رُمَيْتَ إِذْ رُمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رُمَا You did not throw when you threw, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that threw. Now during this battle, Abdurrahman bin Awf radiallahu ta'ala an, was in the saf of the battles. And next to him were two, I would say not young men, two kids. He said, Shaban Yafi'an. Yafi'an is a person that's not reached the age, he's almost reached the age of maturity. And how does somebody reach the age of maturity? When's the age of maturity, Abdullah? 15, are you sure? Well, let me rephrase the question. What are the signs of maturity? Puberty. What are the signs of puberty? Facial hair. Yani, wallahu la yastahmil al haqq Allah is not sh shy from the truth. Hairs in certain parts of your body, private parts, armpits, jayid. Or somebody has a wet dream. These are signs of puberty. So a person is, who is, yeah, fair, is almost reached that age. Not necessarily the age of 15. Because once you reach age of 15, he's a what? He's a teenager. He's not reached sin al murahaqa. He's not reached teenage years. So these two kids, they're not reached teenage years. But they're almost what? Maturing. Some people mature before teenage, as you know. Just like some women become women before even reaching 10. So these two, they're almost becoming matured, but they're not even teenagers. So Abdurrahman bin Awf looked at these two kids and they were talking. They were talking. Then one of them whispered in the ears of Abdurrahman bin Awf because he didn't want his brother to hear what he had to say to who? To Abdurrahman bin Awf. So one of them, he whispered, in the ears of Abdurrahman bin Awf. And he said, Ya Am, O oh, uncle. Did you know Abdurrahman bin Awf? He doesn't know him. Abdurrahman bin Awf is from where? Makkah. And this young man is from where? The people are Ansar, from Medina. But this shows the mannerism and the etiquette we need to instill in our children. That was Sahaba, radiallahu anhu. Anyone older than them was an uncle. And anyone younger than them, they call him Ibn Ammi, my nephew, or my niece. We need to instill this. Because sometimes, even as old as I am, you have some young people, they just call me even maybe 10 years younger, Ismail, Ismail. They call Abu Abdullah, Suleiman, Suleiman. It's wrong. And we need to instill this in our children. So he said to Abdurrahman bin Awf, Ya Am. And it doesn't matter, pardon me, whether it's a driver, whether it's a shopkeeper, because when it becomes a shopkeeper, Sadiq. When it's a shopkeeper, Muhammad. When it's a shopkeeper, Ta'an. La, it doesn't matter. So long as it's older, you must give, and you should instill that in your children to give respect to everybody. It doesn't matter whether it's a driver, whether it's a cleaner, whether he cleans the toilet, whether it's a road sweeper, it's Ammi. Tayyib. So Abdurrahman ibn Awf, they said to you, Ammi, Aina Abu Jahal? One of them said, Where is Abu Jahal? Fa'inni o qad alimtu annahu yasub Rasulullah. Because I know he insults the Prophet. So Abdurrahman ibn Awf looked at this kid and he said to him, Huh? No, where is he? Where is Abu Jahal? Aina Abu Jahal? So now, this, when he said this to Abdurrahman bin Awf, Abdurrahman bin Awf said to him, Da ya ibn akhi, the son of my brother, my nephew, ma'adha tasna' bi Abu Jahal. What are you going to do to Abu Jahal? What are you going to do to him? So he said to Abdurrahman bin Awf, Wallahi, in ra'aytuhu la yufariq sawadi sawadahu. If I see him, my shadow is not going to leave his shadow. We're going to be stuck together. Until one of us dies. Then Abdurrahman bin Awf, subhanAllah, was shocked. And then the other brother now whispered in the head of Abdurrahman bin Awf. He didn't want his other brother to hear too. And he said exactly the same thing to Abdurrahman bin Awf. So now they're both telling him secretly, without the other one knowing what the other one is saying. So in the battle now, Abdurrahman bin Awf, he saw Abu Jahl. He said, Hada sahibukuma. This is the one you've been looking for. Abdurrahman bin Awf, he said, they descended upon Abu Jahl kasakarin. What's a sakar? Ego. They descend upon him, just started to rip him apart. One of them took his shin off completely. Whilst one of them, he killed Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, the, the injury they gave him was a fatal injury. Yeah, he didn't die, but it was fatal, he was going to die. Abu Jahl fell on the floor, rolling with his own blood in the dust. They left Abu Jahal and they went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these two young men. One, his name was Mu'ad and the other one was Mu'awid. Mu'ad and Mu'awid, Ibn Afra, from the tribe of the Ansar, or from the people of the Ansar. And they went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
And each one will say, I'm the one that killed him. I'm the one that killed him. And they're disputing. So the Prophet said, bring me your swords. And he brought the swords to the Prophet and he wiped the blood of each one. He said, both of you killed him. Both of you, you killed him. Also, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala an, he saw Abu Jahal with his fatal injuries. He saw him from far. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu an, he went and approached Abu Jahal. And he said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ya Adu Allah, or enemy of Allah, look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done to you. Abu Jahal, in his arrogance, he said, what's happened? The death of one man does not mean we've lost the battle. He didn't realize the battle had been lost. Because at that point, the mushrikeen, they were getting destroyed. They've been captured as prisoners. They're being killed. They had lost the battle completely. The Sahaba now were just picking them out. So now Abu Jahl hadn't realized. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala an, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a very skinny person, and he had very small shins. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he stood upon Abu Jahl, upon his chest. So Abu Jahl, he looked at him. He said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, subhanAllah, look at Kibar. He said, Qadir taqayta martaqan sa'dan ya ruwai'ya al-ghanam. He said, you, you've risen to a position which is very hard, meaning you've gone beyond your limits. You've gone beyond your boundaries. You shepherd or you goat herder. How dare you? Even in death. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala an, he finished off Abu Jahl. And he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Allahu Akbar, when he knew Abu Jahl was dead. Now this shows us that the Sunnah is at times of happiness and joy to say what? Allahu Akbar. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, ladhi sadaqa wa'dah, wa nasara abdah, wa hazam al-ahzaba wahdah. That all oh, praise be to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala who made his promise true. And he aided his servant. And he destroyed the Ahzab, the Confederates alone. هَذَا فِرْعَوْنَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ This is the Fir'aun of this Ummah. When do we ever hear this? Uh, this Nasara uh, Abda. Oh sorry. Sadaqa Wa'da. Wa Nasara Abda. Wa Hazama Al-Ahzab Wahda. When do we hear this? Eid. Tayyib. We hear this on Eid. You know, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And he goes, Sadaqa wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al-ahzab wa'da. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. This is a bid'ah. This is not related from any of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, to say this. Rather, it's just a takbirat. And another time you could make, which is mushru' to make this is when? In the beginning of Sa'i, Jayid, this particular dua, or this particular praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a bid'ah. So the Prophet sallam said this, and the battle was over, battle of Badr. And the Muslims now were looking for the ones that are killed and injured from amongst them. For amongst the Muslims that are killed in Badr were 14. 14 of the Muslims were killed in Badr. 70 from the elite and the aristocrats of the Quraysh, such as Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Who's Umayyah ibn Khalaf? The master. 14. Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the master of Bilal radiallahu anhu. He's the one that used to torture Bilal. Bilal killed him in Badr. So 70 of them died. 70 were in prison. They were taken back to Medina as prisoners. Jayid, only 14 were killed from the Muslims. As for the remaining corpse, the corpse of the Mushrikeen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he threw their corpse into the wells of Al Badr. And when he threw their corpse there, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started to speak to the corpse. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al wajadtum ma wa'adani rabbukum haqqa. Or al wajadtum ma wa'adakum rabbukum haqqa. Have you found that which your Lord promised you to be the truth? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have found what my Lord has promised me to be the truth. At this point, Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he said to the Prophet sallam, why are you speaking to people that are dead? They could not hear you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, they could hear me as well as you can hear me. However, they could not respond. Some of the ulama, they said this was only a moment for a miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that they could hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking to them. Now, Ibn Rajab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in his book, Ahwal Al-Qubur, 
the conditions of the grave or the situations in the grave. He brought about a narration that isnad or the chain is da'if. And some of the ulama, they accept the chain of narration. Ala kulli hal, the chain is supposed to be da'if. But it's still in his book, Ahwal al-Qubur. And that which narrated concerning this issue of punishment of the grave, he said once, Abdullah bin Umar, he passed by Badr. He passed by Al-Badr. After the Battle of Badr. And when he passed by the Battle of Badr, uh, the, by Badr, he went past a grave. Abdullah bin Umar said, when I went past a grave, a man came out of the grave on fire. And he said to Abdullah bin Umar, Ya Abdullah, asqini, O servant of Allah, O Abdullah, give me some water. Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu an, he said, I don't know if he knew me personally, because he called him Abdullah, or he doesn't know me. Why? Because the way of the Muslims, if you don't know somebody, Ya Abdullah, Ya Akhi, not Ya Muhammad, Ya Sadiq, Although it's become a custom here, Ya Muhammad. And this Ya Muhammad, like we said many a times, is used in a derogatory way by some of the Muslims. They will not call any other person of a status Muhammad. But the cleaner, they call him Muhammad. The guy in McDonald's is Muhammad. Even the kids when I used to teach in school, they're looking for a cleaner, they say, Fain Muhammad. Where's Muhammad? So they'll say, Ya Abdullah. So he said, I don't know if you knew me personally, you didn't know me. He said, Ya Abdullah, it's clean, give me some water. He said, as soon as he said that, another man came out of the grave with a whip made of fire. With a whip made of fire. And he dragged him back inside the grave. Abdullah bin Umar, he narrated this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, ذَاكَ عَدُوُ اللَّهِ أَبُوْ جَهَلِ يُفْعَلُ بِهِ ذَلِكَ إِلَى يَوْمِ السَّاعَةِ إِلَى قِيَامِ السَّاعَةِ Or إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ That is Abu Jahal. It will repeatedly be done like that until the day of judgment. Some of the ulama that said this is not. So this is the end of the battle of Badr. And next week, بإذن الله تعالى, we're going to go to the lessons we could learn from this battle. The fadl, the excellence of people of Badr. And then we'll go back to the tafsir, which will be, inshallah ta'ala, uh, ayat al-siyam, the verses of fasting, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, kashadu an la ilaha